Hi, assalamu alaikum, everyone. Uh, my name is Caden Wimay, and inshallah, I will commence this convention with an introduction um, and a recitation for uh, with Quran, inshallah. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيها الناس إن خلقناكم من ذكر وأنثى وجعلناكم شعوبا وقبائل لتعرفوا إن أكرمكم عند الله عند الله أتقاكم إن الله عليم خبير. O oh humanity, indeed we created you from a male and a female. We made you into nations and tribes so that you may get to know one another. Surely the most noble of you in the sight of Allah is the most righteous among you. Allah is truly all-knowing, all-aware. Sadaqallahu al-Azim. Assalamu alaikum. And welcome to our second National American Muslim Policy Conference, a community-based action research project hosted by Indiana University's Lilly School of Philanthropy. We cordially invited all of you to participate as we have our speakers here for this conference. Our event brings together elected officials, Muslim organizations, experts, community members, and leaders from across the nation to discuss our community's priorities and needs. My name is Iman Awad, and I serve as the Deputy Director at Engage Action. I am honored to be joined today with our esteemed host organizations, including the American Muslim Health Professionals, Institute for Social Policy and Understanding, the Muslim Civic Coalition, and Muslim Public Affairs Council. Without further ado, I would like to introduce our first panel, which will be covering the Muslim vote, elections 2024, and what is at stake. As the 2024 elections approach, it is essential to encourage Muslim civic engagement and participation to amplify our community's voice on election day. However, there is a divide within the Muslim community on how to vote, with some considering a movement to vote uncommitted. How can we guide and unify the Muslim community in making informed decisions during the upcoming elections, especially when dissatisfaction with presidential candidates and party politics, particularly concerning issues like Gaza, is prevalent? This time, I will welcome our moderator, Mohamed Gula, who is the National Organizing Director and Executive Director of Virginia and Engage Action. Dang, I don't get a clap. OK. Yeah. <laughs> Slap. <laughs> Hello. All right. Asalaamu As Alaikum, everyone. Um, welcome. I know you guys can do better than that. I know it's a little early. Asalaamu As Alaikum, everyone. There you go. That was actually really good for the first time. All right. Um, Iman just took my entire introduction. Uh, and so I'm not going to re-say it. As she said, uh, I am the National Organizing Director with M-Gage. Uh, I do data, I do PAC, and I do organizing. However, this is the best panel of the day with the best experts that you will hear from regarding the Muslim vote. And so I'm going to have them actually take a few moments uh, to introduce themselves, inshallah. We'll start um, with Salima. Alhamdulillah. Assalamu alaikum. Good morning, Salima. everyone. My name is Salima Saswell. I was born and raised in the Philadelphia Muslim community. Um, I uh, serve as uh, president and CEO of Evolve Solutions which is a management consulting firm, government affairs, that serves for government affairs and community engagement and policy. I also uh, serve as a consultant for Engage as a national senior advisor in Pennsylvania, senior advisor. I've been working with Engage for about three to four years. Um, I recently founded a nonprofit organization called the Black Muslim Leadership Council. The Black Muslim Leadership Council is a 501c3 organization with a C4 arm, which focuses on policy advocacy, uh, voter uh, mobilization, uh, uh, leadership development, as well as policy. Um, I think I already said policy. I'm missing one. I'm sorry, civic education. Um, I, I founded uh, the Black Muslim Leadership Council because I recognized a um, need to have a dedicated platform uh, to advance um, 
the black American Muslim community and uh, advocate for equity and justice. I, um, I also founded a nonprofit called the Philadelphia Ramadan and Eve Fund. I, I just have so much time on my hands that I'm always working. <laughs> <laughs> the Philadelphia Ramadan and Eve Fund is a charity that supports Muslim families in need. I also serve on the Governor's Commission for Women mm -hmm. and the Mayor's Commission for Faith-Based and Interfaith Affairs in Philadelphia. Thank you. Assalamualaikum, peace, and good morning. Um, my name is Delara Saeed. I'm a Chicago kid. And as a kid in Chicago, I grew up sometimes having the best that my city, my state, and my country had to offer, and sometimes having the worst. And that's the story of way too many Americans, where we felt both the worst and the best. In the world's richest country, in the world's most powerful country, there's no reason why all of us aren't thriving pretty much all the time. And that's what we work for, for civic justice, right? Growing up, I was really bullied. And you know what uh, bullied kids often become? This is my little anecdotal data. They become police officers or teachers. I became an eighth grade US history teacher. And it was because I wanted to learn the story of us. I wanted to learn how my space in my family fit in to this incredible nation's story. And what I found too often was it didn't. My story wasn't in any of the curriculum that I was teaching. Your story wasn't in most of the curriculum I was teaching. And your story was only in there if you were a stereotypical character. And so we need to change that. The data on us as American Muslims is powerful. Our story in this nation precedes this nation. Even before this nation existed, we were here as American Muslims. And so how do we tell that story? How do we use our data? How do we make sure laws made for us are made with us? How do we make sure our public officials understand us and more look like us? And how do we make sure our data and our stories drive equity and action? That's civic justice. That's what we're here to work for. And this is the moment for American Muslims to do it. And I'm honored to be the president of the Muslim Civic Coalition in leading an amazing team and volunteers and a nation ready to do it. Thank you, Muhammad. Um, it's a pleasure to be up here with our um, esteemed pal panelists. And thank you to the Muslim Civic Coalition, MPAC, ISPU, Engage Action. Shout out to all you all, um, uh, American Muslim health professionals. My name is Abbas. I am from a place none of y'all have heard of, Dearborn, Michigan. Um, <laughs> Um, shout out to any Dearborners in the house. Any Dearborners in the house? Make okay, some noise. we got a couple. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, I'm also from um, uh, Arnoun, Lebanon, and um, Bint Jbeil, Lebanon. I was born in Beirut. Um, we immigrated here when I was six, so I'm an immigrant kid. Grew up in our beautiful country um, here. Went on to become a student organizer um, uh, on the University of Michigan's campus. We had an SJP. It wasn't called SJP. It was called SAFE, Students Ally for Freedom and Equality. Some really good people still doing really great work. And I was an organizer on campus, organizing in a context where if you would have told me at that time, and shout out, I, I, I see some University of Michigan people here in the house too. If you would have told me at that time that one day you'll have not just one member of Congress, but multiple members of Congress mm -hmm. who speak full-throatedly about not just Muslims, but Arabs and Palestinians in particular, recognizing their full humanity, endorsing, not just the right to boycott, divest, and sanction, but some supporting it themselves. If you would have told me that we'd have members of Congress who do that, I would have been like, that's not possible. We're, you know, this is an outside game. We can't, we can't work the inside like this. They don't, they, they, don't, they don't like us. I went on to stumble onto Capitol Hill somehow, and it's actually <laughs> not a mystery. There was this really incredible uh, member of Congress who, uh, when I was working in uh, global health, um, well, he was a candidate then, his name is Andy Levin, 
uh, progressive from Michigan, was running on things that I really believed in, Medicare for all, um, immigrant justice, things that I really cared about. And Andy Levin took a chance on me and said, hey, come be my policy advisor uh, on Capitol Hill after I worked on his campaign. Did that for a year and then worked for not just one, but two members of Congress who are my favorite, I hope they're yours too, Congresswoman Rashida Tlaib and Congresswoman Cori Bush, who in this impossible moment of genocide are unflinching, unflinching in standing up for the humanity of every single one of the 15,000 children who've been killed using our tax dollars. It's a very uncomfortable reality. Every single one of us sitting in here is complicit. And that is an uncomfortable reality. It was an uncomfortable reality for me going, working as Congresswoman Tlaib's legislative director and Congresswoman Cori Bush's chief of staff. I understand the United States Congress and our institutions as institutions capable of enormous good. Enormous good. Institutions that sometimes do that enormous good. But also, I went to work every day in those halls knowing that I was going to work at a place that makes policy out of harming and sometimes killing people like us. That's a very uncomfortable reality, but it was one that I came to understand as an immigrant kid. And I came to understand as a child in Lebanon in 2006 when it was US-funded Israeli bombs that were supposed to have killed me. And so that is an expertise that I carry with me into this room, that the humanity, the humanity of Palestinian kids in Gaza right now is not separate from my own. I could have been one of them. And I have an expertise as someone who survived those bombs. We all have expertise as people who have either survived them ourselves or know someone or love someone who survived them. We've got something to say about this issue. And I'm here to engage in this conversation with the experts um, to um, talk about how we build power in this really incredibly difficult moment. What an opening. I told you guys we had the best can uh, pen. So um, let's start off with this. We often hear one of the biggest questions that, that we are constantly and consistently asked is whether or not the Muslim vote will decide the November elections. And so engaging with both campaigns, with both parties, understand that the November election will come down to five states. Michigan, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Arizona, and Georgia. In Michigan, we have 200,000 plus registered Muslims. It was decided in 2016 by 10,700 votes. In Wisconsin, we have over 50,000 registered Muslims. It was decided in 2016 and 2020 by about between 20 and 23,000 votes on each year. In Pennsylvania, in 2016, it was decided by 45,000. In 2020, it was decided by 80,000. We have over 168,000 registered Muslims in Pennsylvania. In Georgia, in 2020, it was decided by 17,000. We have over 68,000 registered Muslims in Georgia. In Arizona, we have over 50,000 registered Muslims. It was about 52. And it was decided by about 10,000 votes in 2020. So when we talk about the power that the Muslim vote has, yes, the Muslim vote can decide the 2024 presidential elections. Not only can the Muslim vote decide the 2024 Muslim elections, the Muslim vote can also decide on who gets the majority in both the House and the Senate because of the pivot districts that are required to win the majority. Now, with that said, comes the introduction, as we all know, because I'm sure all of us took part in, the uncommitted vote, which leads us to this question. What does the uncommitted campaign, movement, and vote mean to each of you in each of your capacities? Why don't we start with uh, Sister Delara this time? Mm -hmm. Thank you, um, Gula. And, and we call him lovingly Gula in the organizing <laughs> world, so thank you, Gula. Um, this is a pivotal moment. Every single one of us said this even in our intro. I agree with you that the electoral college and the vote uh, for the electoral uh, votes will be decided by these five states. But I also think the popular vote will mean a lot in this election. And the popular vote will be decided by all 50 states. So let me explain what that means. The Electoral College, which is our electoral system for voting for president, 
does come down to what these five states will decide. I think right now we're in education mode. We are in agitation mode. We are in protest mode for both of the candidates that are in this space for the Electoral College. It is Biden or Trump who will probably be the nominees of their uh, parties. We are not the only ones who are agitating, protesting, and upset. Jewish brothers and sisters are walking with us on every single protest lines. Latino brothers and sisters are walking with us on every single agitation action step. So are black and brown and tan of every single background. And so, yes, the Muslim vote will count, and it will count with the allies. And together, I believe the Electoral College, we should make a decision by August on what that looks like. The popular vote is the vote that every single one of us can provide. That popular vote, I believe, could go to a third party this year. Giving a third party a popular vote of more than 5%, which if you think about how many people are upset right now, is not a lot. Giving a 5% vote in 2024 opens up the long game. Let's look at what 2026 looks like. Let's look at 2028 looks like. And let's look at beyond. We could start looking at giving American voters more options than our two parties if we vote in blue states and in red states in the popular vote, while at the swing states, they're trying to figure out the electoral vote. And I think these are all amazing ways, and you'll hear other options, that we as an American community are at a pivotal moment to make some decisions on. Thank you so much. Um, so uncommitted. Um, when we first uh, started discussing the idea in Michigan, I, I, I didn't finish my introduction. I got carried away. Um, <laughs> um, now I'm in Michigan. I'm, uh, I'm <laughs> um, I was proud to be one of the leaders of the Listen to Michigan um, Uncommitted campaign um, and uh, one of the leaders of uh, our Uncommitted National Movement. Um, now um, organizing with um, uh, several different folks in Michigan, including an organization called Arab Americans for Progress. Um, and have been really thinking about this word uncommitted, uh, where, where when we first started talking about the idea and, and trying to pull it off in Michigan, um, I, I mean, it's just like, it's a confusing word, uncommitted. Is that something we want to be affiliated with? But there, there's real, and, and people were sort of initially casting the idea as, oh, this is just a protest vote. You know, that, why would you do that? And in a moment of genocide, there's dignity in protest. We in Michigan uh, delivered over 100,000 votes for uncommitted after running a campaign that was specific and targeted and claimed a, 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 an option on the ballot that said uncommitted and said, if you are pro-peace, you vote uncommitted. If you're anti-war, if you're anti-genocide, you vote uncommitted. If you want something different from our president, you vote uncommitted. And that resonated with people. It didn't just resonate with Muslims, by the way. In 75 out of 85 counties in Michigan, we earned over 10% of the vote for uncommitted, for peace against war. Let me tell you, maybe some of you haven't been to certain parts of Michigan. If you go to some of those 75 out of 85 counties, if I went there, if we went there, the, the Muslim population would go up by like 8,000%, right? Like this isn't something that we are alone in. When we take our message to our neighbors, to our friends, and tell them that this is our responsibility, that as we are talking about the needs here at home, needs around people who are unhoused and people who are under-resourced and underinsured or uninsured, people who need access to the things that are necessary for us to live dignified lives, that we're, our people here are being denied that as we're sending billions and billions and billions and billions more dollars to Netanyahu for his most disgusting genocidal instincts, that's something that people, that resonates with people. And so what the Uncommitted campaign gave us was in a moment when, quite honestly, both the Republican Party and the Democratic Party have not been organizing our community because they don't know how to talk to our community like we do. Because the post 9-11 and, and you know, 
predating 9-11, the stereotypes about our community as difficult or simply angry or, or, or not, not willing to engage in the, in, in the political process, those stereotypes are already there. And in a place like Michigan, I'll tell you, one of our biggest political issues before Uncommitted emerged as a vehicle for keeping people engaged, giving them something to vote for when President Biden was failing to do that. If you would have talked to most of my loved ones, relatives, et cetera, in Michigan, one of the biggest issues, political issues, was not something that actually builds our political power. It was a distraction designed to turn us against each other. It was fear-mongering, scaring the Arab community and the Muslim community around the uh, Detroit and Dearborn area that, oh, these books are coming to your schools and you better show up to all these school board meetings and, and otherwise, if you don't, then your kids are gonna go off on the wrong path and, and, and uh, all of this really nonsensical fear-mongering that has nothing to do with building our power, that has nothing to do with mobilizing the Muslim community to vote in our interests, but it's fear-driven. And so, in a moment like that, what we were able to do is say, there's an impossible moment that's been presented to us. And instead of saying, this all sucks, we're scared of everything, let's not engage, not give Biden our, uh, our, our votes or, or Trump or anyone, let's just stay at home, we said, no, we have to give people something to vote for. If we don't give people something to vote for, if we don't give our people something to vote for, then we're leaving our power on the table. We're letting someone else decide for us. Now, the question is very difficult right now, but we didn't, our power didn't just stop growing in Michigan. We've had well over a half million votes specifically for uncommitted across the country with organizers across the country running their campaigns incredibly well, keeping up the protest vote. And in a moment like this, where everyone is saying, hey, just tell us now, Biden or Trump, Biden or Trump, we're saying we're uncommitted, we're pro-peace, we're anti-war. Have you stopped funding the war yet? Have you stopped funding the genocide yet? It's not November yet. We still have time. Of course, uncommitted is not a strategy, it's not a box that we can check in November. So we're gonna have to have some difficult conversations between now and then, and those are conversations that we gotta have together. Those are, and, and quite honestly, they're really hard, maybe impossible conversations, but we gotta have them together. But our focus needs to be not just on the latest distraction or on the, the, the next election. Our focus needs to be on building long-term political power and keeping our community engaged. Thank you, Andrea. Yeah. Yeah. You're just smiling over I'm here. I'm smiling, <laughs> I'm just soaking like, it all know. up. And then I'm also like, now, what am I going to say after Abaz and Dr. Delafer? Like, <laughs> you put me after these people um, who are so extraordinary and amazing. Um, in Pennsylvania, uh, and Gula knows because he, he worked alongside me and other leaders in Pennsylvania, um, Engage was at the forefront of the um, Uncommitted Pennsylvania campaign. And uh, what I recognized was, um, you know, when, we, when it first started as an idea um, with uh, DSA uh, contacting us and just a few other organizers, it was maybe just about two or three groups, honestly, at first. It ended up being 50 uh, different organizations uh, uh, that were a part of the coalition, over 90 volunteers. Um, over 400K calls were made. Um, I think over 20K doors were knocked. Everyone just became more and more engaged, enthusiastic, and invigorated. Um, and it was because people felt that they had power, you know, in the uncommitted campaign. Because without it, folks felt, you know, I believe helpless and, and unsure of what decision to make. To make. And, and, I, and I truly do think that without the uncommitted campaign, many people would not have voted at all, which is never okay, okay. as far as I'm concerned. As Abbas said, voting is your power. You know, I always say to people when I'm giving talks about voting that elected officials, when they're running for office or just candidates running for office, there are two things that are most important to them in their operation. It's checks and it's votes. And oftentimes they know where to get checks even when they, they, they can't get the check, but they, they need your vote. 
they need every citizen to vote for them. And there's power in that, you know, for the voter. There is power in that. Anytime you have an individual or, you know, a campaign that requires you to do something, for you to take an action in order for them to win, there is power in that. And then you have the ability to hold them accountable and to get what you want. We must, as people, as citizens, as Muslims, you know, it, it's even um, mentioned in Surah Tawn Nisa that it is incumbent upon us to seek justice. We ha voting is a part of seeking that justice. And so we have to know that being a part of the process is very, very important um, as it relates to accomplishing and achieving and advancing the needs of our families and our communities. And so the uncommitted campaign for me was powerful. It was, you know, something that gave us the ability to um, have our voices heard. We participated in the election, but we also protested and said, you're not going to get our vote, but we're going to vote. I think that that scared some folks. In Pennsylvania, you know, in Michigan, there were over 100,000 individuals who voted um, uncommitted. In Pennsylvania, it's, it's, we don't have uncommitted as an option. We had to write in, but we had over 60,000 individuals that, that wrote in. You just said that the margin was, what, 48, that was it, over 40, Thousand votes, forty-five thousand, forty-five thousand votes. So, if sixty thousand people voted uncommitted, just think about that. Mm -hmm. I do think that again, like Abba said, there are some serious conversations that need to be had going into the general. I don't think that uncommitted works for the general. I think that we're going to have to make a decision, and um, I actually think that those conversations need to to start happening now. Um, but I, but I do think that the uncommitted campaigns across the nation. Um, gave us a great pathway to demand um, the, just, the justice that we seek as a community. Now, another important conversation uh, is the growing power that we see amongst our youth. Uh, just a quick um, data point, in 2016, or before 2016, the Muslim electorate in many of these states that I had initially shared was actually made up of about 9% of youth, and how I would define youth is anywhere between 18 and 34 years old. Now, that same uh, number is actually made up of 33% of the Muslim electorate. And so we're seeing this number of Muslim youth that are also registering. Now, whether or not they're turning out is a completely different question, um, but another uh, uh, demographic that's equally as important, if not uh, important especially to the campaigns, are black voters. Now, with that being said, knowing that both campaigns are targeting young and black voters, considering the importance of the black vote especially, especially in states like Michigan, more specifically in Detroit, Philadelphia and PA, and in, in Atlanta and Georgia, um, what are we doing in your capacities? What are you doing to organize both communities in your capacities? Uh, let's start with this one. Mm -hmm. okay. <laughs> Just because you're, you're closer mm -hmm. to me. Alhamdulillah. Um, in terms of the youth, we've been reaching out to, in Pennsylvania, we've been reaching out um, to the leaders of encampments at uh, University of Penn, uh, Drexel University Temple. They have a pretty prominent um, encampment. Um, we, we actually uh, just this week received um, some communication from their leadership. And what I um, am doing now is advising uh, th these leaders on, um, they, I, I, they want to be more politically involved. And, and I think what you're going to see is that um, th some of the encampments, I know the um, encampments in the tri-state area are, are looking forward to um, mobilizing for the election, endorsing potentially in the election. There's talk of C4s being created. Um, these young people are so inspiring. And, and it's so great to see, because I am always thinking about succession planning, because I didn't see a lot of it in, in my community you know, and in my generation. And so um, to see these young people and know that these are our future leaders. 
I mean, it's just it's just so inspiring, and I think it's incumbent upon all of us to um, to groom them and and to be mentors to them and to be a support to them and help them along the way. Um, but I but I think that you're going to hear the encampments. It, it's 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 beyond the actual um, you know encampments at this point. It's 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 becoming more of a political movement, and I think you'll see a lot more out of these young people. In terms of the black community, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, in terms of the black community, um, uh, what can I say? I mean, black people are 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 important for any candidate. I, I would say, you know, um, just last week, uh, Biden was in my city, Philadelphia and he launched his Black Voters for Biden campaign. Um, I think that the black communities vote, you, they, for folks need to definitely pay attention to the black community. Um, you know, I, I, what I know is, is this, black people are organizing, they have been organizing for a long time. Uh, what is happening in Gaza right now is deeply impactful upon the black community, why? because our history is that our ancestors suffered 400 years of genocide. And so this resonates with us. We can identify with what this, this suffering is right now. We can identify with this dehumanization, with apartheid, occupation, and all of the things that are taking place right now. Even, um, I would even go as far um, back as to the history of some of our most admired freedom fighters like Malcolm X and Martin Luther King and Shirley Chisholm, um, Angela Davis. These, these people all spoke out about the need for a Palestinian liberation. And, and, and so this is a part of our history. This is something that is deeply, uh, we're deeply, we're deeply connected to, to the pain and suffering um, of, of the Palestinian people. Um, and so we, we stand in solidarity and, and we want to see change. What I would uh, say along with that is while we are advocating for foreign policy, we have to also remember that there are domestic policy issues that are very, very important that are impacting black Muslims and Muslims in urban communities, whether they be African immigrants, uh, Caribbean, Latino, um, we have to remember that the largest proportion of American Muslims are actually African American. And our history dates back to the transatlantic slave trade when Muslims came here on ships, black Muslims who, who were uh, worshipers of Al-Islam. And so we have a deep history and our people are still suffering the repercussions of that genocide that I spoke about. Mm -hmm. And so some of the things that are important in my community in Philadelphia is, is gun violence. Some of you might have read that on Eid, in April, on Eid al-Fitr, at an Eid al-Fitr celebration, there was a mass shooting and three people were shot. It was mayhem, it was traumatizing, we're still dealing with the aftermath of it. And it's real that young Muslim youth are at times either victims or in some way involved in, in, in this and this gun violence and, and this senseless violence is taking place. But then you also have to talk about the um, uh, poor education system and the disparities in, in healthcare, I think, that you mentioned. Um, uh, the, the need for better economic opportunity. I mean, the list goes on and on. So I do think that it's, that we're remiss in not um, speaking up about domestic policy issues that are impacting so many Muslims in urban communities and beyond. Thank you so much. Yeah. I'm just gonna so, notate here, we have about 15 minutes left and I do wanna open it up for questions. And just as a reminder, um, we will have volunteers who will be walking around with note cards. So if you guys do have any questions that you wanna ask, please just uh, have a note card inshallah and then we'll come back to it. Please, Delai. The youth and the black vote, right? I don't know about you, but every time I turn on the news, I am watching youth leaders. <laughs> I'm watching them in encampments. I'm watching them in, in, in as spokespeople for our communities, for their universities, and for other spaces. Um, I am seeing them everywhere. So are we engaging the youth? 
No, the youth is leading us. The youth are leading us. We're getting our pointers from some of the organizing that the youth is doing. Where are the youth? Hey, can you make some noise if you're under 30? Not feel like you're under 30, but are under 30 here? Make some noise. They're here. They're out there. They're everywhere. You are leading us. And to the aunties and the uncles and to us who say, one day you will take over, Take over now, and you're doing it. And so I think we work together. Like So that's how I see engaging the youth, is working together. We have so much to learn in the way that they, they work. And I say they because I feel like I'm under 30, but I'm not. <laughs> so I will call that out. Um, but in the way they work, in the organizations they are building, in the ways they are engaging with each other, in ways that we are learning from them. So. Um, we need that power, that agitation, and that activism, uh, and that mobilizing to become long-term organizing and voter building. And that's what this summer is going to be about, is taking all that mobilizing and turning it into voter power and long-term organizing from the youth. Uh, and I'm excited to work with them in this space. I'm excited, our own, um, at the Muslim Civic Coalition, shout out to our amazing interns and fellows, mm -hmm. um, have, uh, you know, just watching them over the, you know, the last uh, few semesters at school, for those who are in school, and for the new ones that have come on for the summer, just really excited about it. For the African American vote, and I and I will be specific, and, and and not just say the black vote, but it is there is an African American vote and there is an African immigrant vote, and for the African American vote, for there, we are learners, we are learners. In Chicago, we have an organization founded by one of the men who stood on the balcony, as Martin Luther King Jr. was shot, Reverend Jesse Jackson, Rainbow Push led one of the largest and first summits for Gaza in January 2024. So our allies in the black community, we are learning from them. And we have been learning organizing from them. I call Salima and we talk. I, you know, we, we talk to Clyde El Amin. We talk to Mansour Sabri, like across the nation, both in our allies as Christian black leaders, but also within our own community, the black Muslim leaders have been teaching us and those of us who've been lucky enough to learn from them and to sit at everything from their feet or to walk with them on Juneteenth or in any other spaces, we have learned a lot and we have so much more to learn. Again, taking that community and continuing their um, consistent voting trajectory will also be powerful. And the reason we do that is, and the way we do that is through partnership, because you're 100% right, Salima. It is summer. Summer in Chicago means spikes in gun violence. It means young children being killed. The number one cause of death for children under 18 in the United States of America is gun violence. It's gun violence. And black and brown children are the number one cause, uh, percentage of that, of that cause. In America, unacceptable, unacceptable. And so we are right. Black communities understand the angst and the challenge and what is happening in Palestine because they have lived it for hundreds of years. They understand what's happening in Sudan. They're understanding what's happened in Yemen, and we all didn't give that enough attention. They're understanding what happens in Syria and what's happening right now in Venezuela as we destabilize Venezuela, and hundreds and thousands of them are become migrants in the United States. And yesterday, our president signed an executive order to close some of those borders. So we get it. We're learning together. We're leading together, and November is going to be really important for us to show that we have voter power together.
our power um, is not in any one of us individually. I am not powerful on my own. I have a tiny bit of power as an individual. Our power is in our collective power. And we need to think about our collective power in as expansive a manner as possible because especially during an election year like this one, a presidential election year like this one, the forces that be, the people who like the way things are, the people who like that you know, we continue funding the killing of people who look like us indefinitely, those people, they feed on pitting our communities against each other and telling us that if the Arab community gets this, then the Muslim community gets this, or if the Muslim community gets this, then the black Muslim community doesn't get this, or, or, or black American community gets this, then the, then, uh, you know, pitting minority communities against each other is a tale as old as time. And this election year, we have to sit with some very difficult, really, really difficult truths that force us not to have, not, not to be so focused on our short-term memory. If you will recall, there was a mass uprising in our country in 2020, led by black organizers who were telling us, who were pleading with every single person in our country, saying, we're being killed and nothing is being done about it. And here we are years later, you know what the highest year on record for police killings ever was? Last year, 2023. You know what the, you know what the highest year, uh, 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 the second highest year? The year before that. You know what was the third highest year? The year before that. The problem has not stopped. And the idea that militarized violence, whether it's in Gaza or whether it's against our students here who are in campus, or whether it's against black youth all across our country, like Mike Brown, and Trayvon Martin, and all of, and, and Sandra Bland, and all, 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 of the, all of the black youth who we know, whose names we know, are, continue to be killed by police. If we think that it's okay to say, okay, well, we're just gonna focus on the foreign policy piece of this and, and not, not focus on the domestic policy issues and, and vice versa, it's a losing game. And so this year, people are weighing a lot of different things, and if there are people for example, in our black community who say, hey, I'm, I ha I'm weighing a lot of different things. I'm voting for Biden this year. It's incumbent upon us as Muslims, the majority of us, by the way, as Salima pointed out, are black American. It's incumbent upon us not to shun those people or say you're a genocidal supporter and, 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 and the genocide is on you and all of that stuff. Guess what? Every single one of us is complicit in the genocide. We all pay taxes here. Okay, this is bigger than just any one individual voter. We're talking about collective power here. It's also incumbent upon us to, if there's someone in our community who is really struggling with it and saying, hey, President Biden funded the genocide and so I'm voting for Trump now, we can't give up on that person. We can't say, oh no, how dare you? You, you, you want the Muslim ban to come back, all that stuff. No, we, we gotta have these difficult conversations. And, and I think it's incumbent upon us as leaders it's incumbent upon us as leaders ahead of November to talk about how dangerous, we know how dangerous it is that President Biden is continuing to fund Netanyahu's genocide, but also how dangerous it is that Donald Trump and the white supremacists that surround him, including his son-in-law, who are fantasizing actively about colonizing Gaza Beach and displacing Palestinians permanently and building million and billion dollar whatever condos over there, our community needs to hear that this isn't just about this moment. We have to tell the truth about Donald Trump. We have to tell the truth about the fact that there is not a single federal elected representative or senator on the Republican side that has called for a ceasefire, not one. And the idea that we will have a better chance at stopping occupation or apartheid or genocide under Donald Trump is fantasy. It's fantasy. So we're gonna to have to have some very difficult conversations. We're gonna to have to hold each other's pain. People are, people are organizing and, and, and voting through their pain and we can't write each other off. 
100%. You guys pretty just went into, so all of these <laughs> questions were for that answer. Um, but I'm going to open up. And our third question was for that answer as well. So I'm glad that everyone here is thinking about the same thing. Um, so some of these questions were about um, the, third, the third party. You mentioned the populist vote. Um, it was also revolved around, like, what would you recommend? And, and I'm really going to open it up here. Actually, let me read a couple yeah. of them in the sense that, just so that, because there's, there's a specific thing that some folks were saying about um, Dr. Sayed. I, I do want you to hit on the third party piece. Yeah. That is something that, but there was, uh, in regards to uncommitted come November, what do you recommend Muslim voters do when they no longer along with Biden nor Trump? And you kind of hit on that briefly, but we'd like to expand on that. Um, it also, uh, there was also a question, now I'm trying to find it, about um, how are we bringing different ideologies and different perspectives, and you did kind of hit on that about giving each other grace. How are we uniting as a community in a vote under a, like a voter block this November when both options or even when, as mentioned, you're, you're saying that the third party option is an option, and as I mentioned, we'd love to hear more about that, but if people are considering that it isn't really an option, and there might be a protest vote, and what does that look like? So I really want to open it up, because that's what all of these questions are for, <laughs> is November, like when that comes, um, based on your experience, based on your expertise, based on your conversations that you're having, and your calculus, where do you feel like that lands, or what advice would you give? Was that good, y'all? Because I feel like everybody <laughs> here just hit me with. <laughs> um, when we all started speaking today, when we started the program today, we started with the Quran. We started with Salam. We're in this program together today, and regardless of who's watching it and what faith you are, faith is important to us. It leads us. It drives us. It centers us and it grounds us. And so our faith and our values of justice, we said salam when we started, peace, equity, drive this work. So when I say our faith drives it, our faith requires us to fight for justice, equity, and peace. And that's why we do this work. That's why we're all here. So in the end, when we vote, we do need to vote our values. We do need to vote our faith and our community. And then I said, when we vote, and that means the second piece, as American citizens, our right, an incredible right, and our incredible responsibility is to vote. And I am so grateful and <laughs> actually long time coming, many of our imams, many of our faith leaders from Umar Suleiman to Imam Ubaidullah Evans to Imam Mansour Sabri are saying we must vote. And so our faith leaders, our civic leaders, and our political leaders are aligned as Americans. If you are a citizen, you must vote. If you are not a citizen, you get your family and friends and everyone else who is a citizen to vote. And so that's really critical. Uncommitted, as Salima and Abbas and I all said, motivated us. If we didn't have a good choice in the primary, we could vote uncommitted. And that would still mean you go vote. You pull that ballot, you vote uncommitted, or you leave it blank. In Illinois, 110,000 voters, Muslims and their allies, voted either uh, leave it blank or vote in Gaza. State after state, it worked. What will work in November? This is a nuanced conversation. There has to be a swing state, a red state, and a blue state opportunity. The red and blue state won't decide necessarily between a Biden or Trump presidency. So like, we can get out there and vote third party. But I want to keep bringing it back up to vote to vote, whatever excites you to vote. If it's down ballot because your congressperson is a great person or a horrible person, vote for or against him. If your state representatives, and remember, we're voting for state representatives. Most of our day-to-day -day life situations and experiences are decided at the state level. We are a United States of America, but we are 50 states in a federation. 
called the United States of America. So what lo it looks like in Georgia, what it looks like in Utah, what it looks like in Missouri, what it looks like in Illinois could be very different in terms of your rights. You have to vote for your state representative. So number one, we have our values. Number two, we have our vote. And number three, we have a nuanced opportunity on who we vote for. That third party in red or blue states, you should know who you are, a red state or a blue state, meaning you mostly will go Democrat or you mostly go Republican, can be very powerful message from our community to the political parties that you two don't serve us. <clears throat> and if we must, we will vote for a third party because our values aren't, um, our values are perfect, our vote is imperfect, but we could have choices. And again, in the purple and swing states, we can still stay uncommitted, not committed, however you want to call it, until we learn more. We need to get to ceasefire. We need to get to better gun control. We need to get to uh, um, rebuilding Gaza. This is just a beginning. We need to get to housing equity in our nation. We need to get to immigration reform in our nation. Keep pushing both parties to get us there. It is June 5th. Learn and move. The happiest thing that I saw this week, because if you say, what's the best part of your week? I was speaking in North Carolina earlier this weekend. I walked in and somebody about age 21 said, ma'am, are you registered to vote? and handed me a registration form for North Carolina. One of these exists in every single state. North Carolina's looks like this. Illinois's looks like this. Every time I go into a different state to speak, I ask to see their voter registration cards. That's what we should all be doing right now. Learning and educating about the candidates, but number one, getting our communities registered and ready to vote. <clears throat> So um, I told myself coming into this panel that I'm not going to tell people how to vote um, because I, I fundamentally feel that voting is a personal decision. And I think that what I would like for everyone to do is to do the work, research these candidates, all of them, because the local races, the state house races, the um, the, the congressional races, these, these people are the ones that are um, establishing the policy that controls our lives every day. In terms of the presidential race, you have to, you, what we do when we're um, measuring candidates is we have a scorecard and we, we look at viability. We look at uh, what, what, what they've done for Muslims or for you know, the black community if you're black or you know, uh, the, the, the Muslim American community as a whole. We look at all these different things. What is, what is their history? What is their background? What is their, tra what is their track record? What, what will our experience be as Americans if they are voted into office? These, these are all the things that you're supposed to be looking at when you're making a decision about who you want to vote for. I would not be, I don't, I, I, I think that I have a responsibility to say this. Encouraging people to vote third party and, and saying that this is something that is powerful. I'm not going to say whether you should do it or not. Again, I think you should vote based upon your values, what's best for your community, uh, what's best for your family. But I will, I do want to make this point clear. If you vote for a third party, especially in a major swing state in this election, and you are a Democrat, this is helping Trump, period. So it might, you said something earlier about fantasizing. If you might think you're doing something or, you know, you know, rah, rah, but at the end of the day, you are helping Trump. And so I want you to know that and be comfortable with that if that is your decision to do that, stand, stand on that. But know that you are not only abstaining 
if you're uncommitted in the general, if you're third party, we, 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 we know that this is what it is. Mm -hmm. You're helping Trump win. And that's why that nuanced strategy, right? Like, think the nuanced strategy. Don't think national strategy. It doesn't have to be one national strategy. You can have a nuanced strategy based on your state and still get the message out. Um, but yeah, I agree. And I think if we're and saying that all together, that the swing states uh, need to get us to a, the best possible choice. And what is most important to me is that people vote because I have yeah. a lot of people telling me that they're not going to vote at That's all right. because they're confused. Please don't give up your, your power. Do not give up your right to vote. You should vote. If that means voting for you looks like voting for a third party or voting uncommitted, do that. Yeah. If that's all you have left and you feel like you can't do anything else, do that. Know what comes along with that, but vote. Do whatever you have to do to make your voice heard in this election. That's, that's my advice. Four minutes for this. Yeah, and I'm only going to add this just because I got it and I feel like you already hit on a lot of these points. So I'm going to add this one for you, which is, um, again, the question is, uh, there is much to talk about voting, whether it's uncommitted, third party. Um, the question is, why is it so hard to make this choice? Like, they want you to just straight up say, why is it so hard to make this choice? Shouldn't we all just agree to make the choice as a voter block? And shouldn't all our votes kind of be in, like, one basket, which is like a voter block? And we're just wondering why it's why we don't just make the choice and why it's so difficult for us to make the choice. So for us, the calculus is, is very easy for us because we're in the space. But for the common person, let's say, in Ohio or in Michigan, or they're like, well, why is it so difficult for all of us to just get behind someone? I trust, for example, folks may trust what you're going to say. So if you just say, hey, no, today we're going to vote for Biden. We're not going to vote for Trump, and this is why. Or we're going to vote for Trump. We're not going to vote for Biden. This is why. As organizers and as experts, why is that choice so difficult? <laughs> I'll put you on blast. <laughs> you hit on it a little bit. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the, the, the thing is, part of why this is so hard is, um, you know, when October happens, that's, you know, I can speak about my own experience. That's not something that's happening very far away that I'm experiencing as foreign policy. That's something that I'm feeling in my body, right? That's something that, like, I, I go to sleep at night, and, you know, th for me, it's the sort of PTSD, like, the, the night terrors that come of, like, picturing myself in those buildings. In a moment like this, when so much is riding on the presidential election, in some ways, we have to continue having this conversation specifically about voting, and I you know, affiliate myself with, uh, 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 with, my, with both my sister's comments here about the, the essential nature of voting. In other ways, we also can't take our eye off of the, you know, one of our most urgent priorities is there's a kid in Gaza right now whose life could be saved if there were a ceasefire, if our government stopped sending 2,000 pound bombs and all the other murderous machinery that our government is sending there. Yes, November is important, but we need to keep up the pressure right now and not wait for November, right? That's what Uncommitted has been about. It's like, we, got, we need pressure right now, right? And we need to think strategically as a community about where are the inflection points where the media is going to be super interested and uh, the politicians are going to be super interested and they have their interests at stake, et cetera. And then also, where do we currently have a little bit of power where we really got to protect that power. We can't lose it. I know two really good answers to that. Their names are Cory Bush and Jamal Bowman. They have really important elections coming up. Yeah. Congressman Bowman's election is at the end of this month. Congresswoman Bush's election is, is at the beginning of uh, August. Those are essential elections that we need to be taking a look at our, our, as a community and doing everything that we can to make sure that we don't lose the power that we have now. Um, there also happens to be a really important convention coming up. One of the things I forgot to mention in our introductions is I am 
you know, our, our movement earned uncommitted delegates. I was elected an uncommitted delegate from Michigan. I'm one of two. We've got Rima Muhammad, uh, who's also an uncommitted delegate. So we have not a whole lot, right? We didn't set out to earn delegates, but we have a few delegates who are going to be at the convention. And the Democratic National Convention is going to be a really important organizing moment for our community. There will be uh, protests, there will be gatherings, there will be, you know, whatever it is that you feel comfortable participating in. If you can go to Chicago, go to Chicago. As uncommitted, we will host you. Come, come to Chicago, come the... <laughs> we will find a place for you, and you will stay with us, and yeah. we will do this together. And, and it's an important organizing moment for us to keep up the pressure to not lose sight of the responsibility that we have to that kid in Gaza whose life could be saved if there were a ceasefire right now, if our government stopped sending weapons now. And so, yes, we got to have the conversation about November. And let's keep having the conversation, but also not lose sight of the fact that the bombs continue to fall. And we can't, we can't, we can't give up the idea, on the idea that we can stop them before November. All right. And so, um, if there are any urgent things that you all would like to close with, I'm going to give you all a minute each, and then I will close. I know a minute isn't really helpful, but I hope a lot of the remarks that you wanted to make were made, inshallah. So I'll give you guys a minute each uh, to close, because I would love for you guys to, to leave our audience with some speckles of hope. I'll start. Um, first of all, I want to thank all of you for being here, because it shows that you are engaged and that you're ready um, to, to do the work. I just want to leave you with something very simple. Um, a huge part of democracy is leveraging your power to get the most out of government on behalf of your family and the community that you serve. And so think about that as you consider who to vote for in, in all of these races. And um, just do the research. Organizations like Engage, Black Muslim Leadership Council, Muslim Civic Coalition, we're here to help guide you and support you with resources and just stay engaged, inshallah. inshallah. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. I echo uh, Salima's words, thank you. Um, and I want us to feel positive and motivated about our future. It's really important for us to see hope, even with the decimation that we have been watching unfold across the world and in our own homes and streets. So if you look at then, if you take uh, hope and you say, OK, where does the American Muslim hope lie? You know I started with telling you as a former US history teacher, I'm going to tell you in the trajectory of US history, American Muslims are killing it in a good way. We are <laughs> experts. <laughs> Great choice of words. <laughs> we are experts in sector after sector, right? We are uh, voices that speak about, to reason and values in every space we go. We are excellent students, excellent leaders, and excellent neighbors. And so do not forget that, again, in the trajectory of our community across the last 400 years in this land, we have great things ahead and a lot to hope for. A lot to hope for, inshallah. inshallah. Um, I just want to close by uh, thanking my sisters and my brother up here um, for um, a, a, a thoughtful discussion and thanking you all. Um, you know, we're, we're all trying to make sense of, again, what feels uh, like an impossible moment. And the, what, what feels clear to me, it felt clear to me after 2020, we can't go back to ignoring the, the violence, structural and otherwise, that, black, uh, that our black neighbors and community members are enduring. We can't stay silent about systemic racism. What fe feels clear to me now is we have to have an eye towards our collective power 
uh, and how we build our power and not undermine our power. And part of how we do that is we know as Muslims there are certain pressures, and certainly we felt them before the start of the genocide, and certainly we will continue to feel them, but there have been certain pressures when we show up in political or organizing spaces or otherwise, or professional spaces, to just leave Palestine at the door. It's too controversial. This moment of genocide tells us that we can't just talk about Palestine as a rapid response situation. Something fundamental has to shift. So we can't stop talking about the need for Palestinian liberation, the need for a free Palestine. We can't stop talking about the fact that we, our government, our, our, our people, are complicit in what is happening there. And we can't disconnect that work from a broader need in our country, and this is my personal view, for an anti-war movement that encourages our country to divest from killing and invest in life. That is an essential piece of our organizing that we must not lose sight of because we have an important role to play as people who are experts, experts in the idea that Muslims are not to be killed indiscriminately and without cause, or, or, or Muslims are not to be killed using US taxpayer funds without consequence. We can't, we can't sit with that anymore, okay? We have to leave that in the past Moving forward, we have to insist on our humanity and our collective liberation, including Palestinian liberation. All right, I'm being told to stop now. So um, we are going to conclude, inshallah. There was a question here about public health. There is going to be a health care um, session or panel uh, later on in the afternoon, so I'll make sure that I share that with this. Thank you all for providing us with the hope. And as a final reminder, Everyone that is here, please make the promise to support Uncommitted as they go through uh, in August. This is a critical time to make sure that not only are we showing up in Chicago, mm -hmm. but we're also supporting our organizers, our hidden figures, essentially, um, who a lot of people will see. But this, I, I tell our team, I'm sure all of you would agree that this is the hardest job ever because sometimes you have to make decisions that people don't fully understand mm -hmm. uh, and make sure that you guys are tuning in to the education symposiums that um, uh, the Muslim Pacific Coalition has been hosting very informative very valuable of course support Black Leadership Council um, Black Muslim Leadership Council I'm sorry mm -hmm. and and Salima and everything that in the work that she's doing to uplift Black Muslim voices Engage we've already we've already launched our Million Muslim Votes program if you're looking to volunteer please support we also have a PAC and Super PAC where we are supporting Jamal Bowman we are supporting other candidates that are pro ceasefire inshallah so if you're capable of giving capable of volunteering reach out to any one of us inshallah um, and hopefully you all can lead us to victory come November inshallah all right